In the program, we were talking with uh, Alex Leslie with Atri, the American Transportation Research Institute, and uh, they've got a new report out indicating uh, that uh, some of the best ways to integrate younger adults aged 18 to 25 into the trucking industry, and they took a compilation of the data, analyzed surveys, they talked with younger drivers, had carrier interviews, and they took the latest workforce statistics, and uh, a lot of the data they got uh, was from those uh, on the front line, the drivers, and also from those in the executive suite. They were giving their feedback, and uh, bottom line, they're looking for solutions to bring people in uh, to the uh, industry. And I think uh, that with what is going on with the Great Resignation, uh, that is hitting so many aspects of the trucking industry that uh, many people are saying, okay, what can be done? But uh, Joel Patterson is joining me now uh, to talk about a very interesting report. Uh, we talk about bringing in more of the workers, say, to drive the trucks and uh, maybe more to work in supply or safety and things like that. But uh, this story indicates is that a lot of those that are in the executive office are seriously thinking about uh, getting out themselves, resigning, leaving, saying bye-bye. They want to get a job that's going to better support their well-being, and it's a very important thing to consider. Uh, it does matter a lot. I mean, if you got the boss who is setting the rules, he's feeling burned out, Joel. It's no surprise that uh, many of the rank and file are also maybe feeling the same way. Welcome to the show, Joel. Welcome back to the program. Thanks, Mark. It's good to be here. And yeah, you're right. It's uh, it's kind of not that much of a surprise, though, right? If everybody that is has been struggling with what we've talked about over the last couple of years, and um, whether it's working from home, or whether it's the, the tight labor market, or whether it's pay or social justice or anything, there's a million different things you can fall back on. Uh, but the, the you know the leaders of these companies have been tasked with leading. Right, and, and yeah. making sure that they are getting and, and, and doing the things that they needed to do in order to survive that time, and I think it's kind of caught up to them, and they're kind of facing the same same issues that a lot of the rest of us have faced uh, over the last couple of years, and, and really just realizing that hey, maybe I not only need to preach these things, but maybe I need to live them as well. Mm, Going to say now, this is uh, something that you follow day in and day out along with a number of other things on the labor market. Uh, tell folks a little bit about your background and your website. Uh, what uh, what brings what, what is that that you bring to the table with that? Talk about that. So what we do is uh, we work with a, an Oracle product called NetSuite, and, and <clears throat> it's a piece of software, right? It doesn't really matter. But what we do is we put it into companies that allow them to scale and grow. And so everybody's heard of QuickBooks, and a small company they run QuickBooks up until they decide that they've gotten too big for that to support them. And so then they would they would call someone like us and we would put that in. Um, now what we do though is really kind of change that business and now also really focus on the labor and the people side of it because that's I mean that's that's where the real work is, right? And and making sure that people are are engaged, productive, and then kind of back what we were talking about before, you know, I mean, we, we every company that we work with has these same problems that we've been talking about around uh, making sure that their people were engaged, that they were healthy, uh, but more than anything, trying to make sure they're doing everything that they can do to keep them retained. It's very difficult to recruit and hire people these days. Uh, great resignation, call whatever you want. People have right. been moving around a lot, and regardless of whether or not we're in, heading into a recession, the labor market has not eased up. And so that just creates a lot of stress for people, for these companies. And I think what we're talking about with the CEOs and the leaders of these companies is they are, you know, they've been kind of grinding through this for the last couple of years as well, and they're no different than the rest of us. But right. unfortunately, when they're in that position, no one's going to feel sorry for them. When, when somebody that uh, is in the executive suite, uh, say that leaves a trucking company, the door is open, vacant, uh, all the stuff is cleared out, does that create a certain sense of anxiety uh, among the rank and file, those that are still there, as to uh, uncertainty as to who may be coming in, what changes that they make. I mean, if you got a boss that's frazzled and depressed, uh, that uh, you know they got to do what's important to them. They got to maybe get their mental health in line. Uh, but does that create some anxiety for those that are left, that are kind of left behind if that uh, C-suite executive office is vacant at the moment? Yeah, a hundred percent. You know, I I, uh, I saw George W. give a speech uh, a few years ago, and regardless of what, it's not a political comment here, but one thing he said about the most important characteristic he 
believed he needed to have as president of the, of the country is optimism because people don't follow yeah. pessimism. And if, if you're walking by an office and you see an empty leader's office and you know nothing going on, you're absolutely going to be concerned. I mean, and if you're not, you're probably you're probably not aware of the situation. Uh, so yeah, that's exactly what we're talking about is is recognizing that that they're people too. Um, and, and don't be afraid if you see something like this happening where your leader, your CEO seems to be kind of checked out, uh, ask them about it. You know, I mean, those are the kind yeah. of conversations that really allow people to develop relationships and trust and vulnerability. And, and that's the best way to get them back on track. And just don't forget that they may need, a, a, you know, just a friendly, friendly call every now and then just like you. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Just kind of let them know everything is going to be, you know, it's going to be okay. Uh, but like you mentioned, though, that uh, they've been carrying a lot of extra weight on their on their shoulders. This survey that I'm reading, uh, that was released by Deloitte uh, and the market research firm Workplace, uh, finds that 76 uh, percent of the higher ups said the pandemic has negatively affected their overall health, and 81 uh, percent said improving their own equilibrium more important now uh, than advancing their own career path. I mean, when you look at these numbers of like 76% saying the pandemic has negatively affected their health, I would imagine that uh, there could be a lot of lot of bad decision making uh, by those in the managerial suite, right? Because uh, could that indeed cloud their judgment uh, when they're facing uh, all of these obstacles on their shoulders? How do you see it? Yeah, how could it not, right? And uh, I think for the, the really successful leaders, that got through the pandemic in a, in a productive manner, most of them were able to step into more of a you know, wartime CEO is what it's usually called. And, and in a situation where you've got to make decisions on the fly and you've got to not necessarily get everyone's input, if, you, if those people were actually kind of pulling back during that time and not willing to, to engage into that new environment, that's stress. That's not good for the company, but it's also not good for them. And so I think that, that you know, as we've kind of, weathered the storm, so to speak, uh, and now, you know, as we're potentially heading into another one, uh, it's, right. it's, it's not surprising that they would feel that way. Well, let's do this, Joel. i got a break for a few minutes. Commercial time. Joel Patterson is on. And uh, join us, uh, ladies and gentlemen. The phone number is 888-876-2336. And uh, let's talk about what's going on in your company. Uh, are some of the executives leaving the organization? You know, are they at a point where maybe the boss said you're so used to seeing maybe in a corner office uh, when you go into the trucking company is gone and uh, somebody else is in there or the office is vacant? Uh, you know, does that create a sense of anxiety uh, when somebody, maybe a trusted leader, leaves the organization? They get burned out as well. Uh, so let's talk about what's going on there. Are you seeing that in your company? No names, obviously. Uh, but uh, if you're seeing that, we'd like to maybe get you on board to talk about uh, what are some of the trends that you are noticing uh, when it comes to all of that. Joel Patterson is on board with us. And uh, call us. You know the phone number. It's 888 You know, we often hear about uh, drivers that uh, are leaving the industry or maybe they're going to work for another company out there. I mean, it's a great resignation, no doubt, that's still here. And uh, folks are looking for a better path, better way to go. Uh, but a story that you really don't hear that much about involving the great resignation is what's going on in your boss's office, that uh, those that are in the C-suite uh, telling Deloitte pollsters they're seriously looking at maybe getting another job. Uh, in other words, walking out, trying to find something that's going to be supporting uh, their well-being and over overall. And why it matters that if a boss who sets the rules are feeling burned out, you know, they're done. It's no surprise that a lot of the people that are working for them are going to feel the same way, uh, that they're going to just say, okay, done, enough, I'm out, got to go find something else out there. And, uh, Joel, again, thank you very much for joining me in the show uh, to talk about this, do you think this will raise uh, more awareness? In other words, uh, do you think that the uh, suits or the C-suite executives may do more uh, to try to improve employee wellness, health benefits, maybe, maybe getting better if they recognize this situation going on? 
Well, if they haven't already, then they're probably the largest victims of the Great Resignation. I mean, there's no question that uh, it, the pandemic redoubled the commitment of, of companies to invest in their culture, make sure that their people are taken care of. Uh, I mean, that's really how you do it. The issue, and it was highlighted in the same survey that I think <laughs> is really interesting, is the fact that there's, there's kind of a big disconnect between what the CEOs are seeing versus what the employees are seeing. One of them said that, uh, or one of the, the data points was 91% of the CEOs saw themselves as caring leaders, mm. but only 56% of those same companies thought their bosses care about their well-being. I mean, that's a that's a very significant difference and, and might might say a lot around what CEOs are feeling in general. Well, how, how do you explain that? How do you explain the disconnect that uh, one group says, hey, we're doing great, and the other group says, well, wait a minute, you know, we're not. How do, you, how do they perceive that? Well, I think that? a lot of confirmation say? bias. You know, okay. I mean, you know, they're just, they're, but I think it's also, there are a lot of companies, I see them all the time, you know, in, in what we do, it allows us to go into lots of different companies and see how they run their business. And you'd be surprised how many companies are still led by people who manage by intimidation or don't have any relationships with their people for the most part at all. And I think those are the ones that are kind of uh, narcissistically looking at the situation and saying, oh, well, I'm just doing a great job. Those people just don't get it. And I think that so, that's just, you know, that's a that's an old school way of looking at things that really doesn't make any sense anymore. Yeah, absolutely. And I was going to say that's kind of like 1980s thinking, right? Uh, but that's still, oh, it's still exactly. prevalent today. Goodness sakes. Okay. And you would think, though, that uh, once the executives see the turnover rate going up and they got people running out the door going on to something else and you're bringing new people in, you got to train them, that's going to impact the bottom line. Wouldn't they ultimately see that their policy is not working when costs are going up for like training or new hires that are coming in not not cheap to train somebody these days when they see that in the numbers? It's, it's not a short-term solution right it's, yeah. you, you've got to make that investment and, and invest in your people consistently and intentionally and and if they're not recognizing those signs in their financial statements or through the attrition rate then i hope somebody else on their team is, is pointing it out because they're not going to last now, there's no way a company can continue to survive these days if they're not really focused on the right people and getting them in the right seats and treating them the right way. It just costs way too much money. Just like you said, it costs way too much money to replace, uh, train, and then and then put somebody new out in the field. Uh, so you know, investing early, it doesn't you, you not, don't necessarily see it in the financials day one, but you certainly right. see it over the long haul. Do we lose a lot of that? Uh, personal one-on-one -on -one touch uh, when we are doing hiring, say, by uh, Zoom or we're doing maybe a phone interview. Uh, do we lose a lot there that uh, somebody may not feel like they're part of an organization if they're doing it virtually? I know the reality is that a pandemic, but uh, is there a lot lost there when we don't do this in person? It, it has made it incredibly difficult to really know the person that you're hiring. I mean, okay. to me, the most important time in a recruiting visit or in an interview is the few minutes before the interview and the few minutes after the interview and really sort of casually getting to know that person. Or maybe other people are walking around. Really, when you're doing it just over Zoom, you're getting their polished, focused effort and not exactly. a really good understanding of who they are as a person. We're still working on that. We're getting better at it. But, yeah, absolutely, it's a, it's, a, it's a tough thing to do. When you are talking with uh, companies, you go in there uh, and you talk to them about their hiring policies, practices, and things like that, are there such glaring mistakes that uh, might be part of the C-suite uh, philosophy that you got to stop and say, well, wait a minute, why are you doing this and why are you doing that? Uh, it's a new day and age. Is it kind of like a light bulb moment, an eye-opener moment for those that you're going in to talk with, maybe not realizing some of the policies are contributing to people leaving the organization? Yeah, as long as they're uh, willing to learn and have an open mind, it, those light bulbs go off all of the time because most companies have been doing the, what they're doing the way they do it because they've always done it that way. And nobody can really tell you why. And okay. if you're willing to step back and look at it, yeah, it's, a lot of times it's just very obvious stuff. Like around recruiting, just score people. You know, have some basic scoring, a couple of metrics where you ask people that interview them to give them a one through five score. Uh, just something that's a little bit data representative. And little things like that aren't even being done. So it is. It, you, I don't want to overcomplicate things, and our team would never overcomplicate things. It's really more about 
how do you make this simple and engaging to people and allow you to, to really represent your company in the way that you want. Yeah, absolutely. And this would this would be the same philosophy, right, for uh, managers inside of the organization. I mean, if you've got a group of managers reporting to a CEO on a daily basis, uh, the policy has got to be uniform. It's got to be consistent. It's got to be inclusive. It's got to reflect diversity. If it doesn't, folks are going to be leaving. Got about a minute left here. What do you think? Yeah, no, they definitely will. And I would say around HR just in general, and I think most people can see this, over the last couple of decades or few decades, we've gotten into this this industry of compliance. Everything has to be compliant. We have to have a policy. We have to say exactly what's going to happen and what can't happen. And unless right. you're building a space shuttle or a rocket, I think you're much better off simplifying that process and treating people like adults. But if you don't do what you just said and really make it consistent and intentional from top to bottom, it won't work. Right. But as long as you live and breathe it, it's a great policy. All right, outstanding. Joel, where can folks find you, good sir, on the, up on the web? Where can they go to reach out? You can, um, I'm the founder of the Vested Group, and it's thevested.com, and love to talk to you about your uh, internal systems. Outstanding. Joel, thank you, man. Let's do it again. Joel Patterson on the line with us, ladies and gentlemen. And, yeah, the philosophy inside of the workplace certainly is changing. Uh, that, uh, you know, your boss might be looking at the exit himself, uh, maybe going on to something else out there, and there could be a number of things, cumulative stress, could be maybe overworked and things like that. Uh, but, indeed, the labor force changing. Great resignation still is uh, one of the key items for the economy.